I'm going to I'm going to start this morning in Ephesians chapter four. I'm going to try to I've been trying to shorten my messages, but they just get longer. But I'm still working on it. Amen. So I'm going to try to be brief this morning. Now, remember, after, remember, how, did you do your reading assignment? You had a reading assignment of Ephesians chapter 1. It's one of my favorite chapters. It has got so much in it. It's awesome. And so I encourage you to read it. And uh, every week we'll be giving you assignments, reading assignments. And read that as many times as you can in the week. And then uh, right after the service, we'll go into the cafeteria after each service. And we will uh, talk about and discuss what we read. Amen. Uh, we try not to, to go over about 30 or 40 minutes in that, but we uh, ask you if you would like to. It's, it, I'm telling you, it's good because it keeps us in the Word, amen, and we learn from one another, okay? So it's a little different thing than we've ever done, but I think it's awesome. Praise God. In Ephesians chapter 4, did I tell you to turn there yet? Ephesians chapter 4. Now you understand that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. But he's also writing to the church at Carnesville because he said to the saints that are in Ephesus and the faithful in Christ Jesus. So that includes us. In the 21st verse, he said, if so be that ye have learned or heard of him and have been taught by Jesus as the truth is in Jesus. Okay. 22nd verse says that ye put off concerning the, con the conversation, the old man. Conversation here means your lifestyle. Put off the old lifestyle when you're born again. The old man is the man that you used to be before you received Jesus. Amen. Even though you've been born again and you get a new spirit, you didn't get a new brain. You didn't get a new mind. You didn't get new emotions. Amen. And so you have to put off something. He said, put it off. In other words, he was writing to Christians. Are you listening to me? That have been born again. They got new spirits, but they still need to put off some things. Well, we need to keep continue putting off some things. That's why we're having deliverance services. But you know, I could. I, what I, I like what Andre said the other day about changing clothes. You know, when I began to lose weight, I didn't lose it all at one time. So I had to go like from a 50 down to a 48 and 40, 48 down to a 44 and from a 44 down to a 40. And so you got to keep buying new clothes all the time. Amen. And then you go on, you keep on down till you get to 34, uh, 34 ways. Then, then, then you, 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 you plateau and that's where you're going to stay. Amen. But the thing is that uh, as you, as, as things change in your life, uh, you, and now a better a better illustration is probably when you keep gaining weight and you keep going, you have to put on new clothes. So when things change in your life, you have to put on other things. Amen. And you have to put off other things. Okay. Hallelujah. So uh, yeah, with 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 weight loss is where I'm concerned. Uh, I had to put off some things. Amen. All right. That you put off concerning the former conversation, that is the old lifestyle of the old man, which is corrupt, that is rotten, according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and uh, that you put on the new man, which is after God, is created in righteousness and ho true holiness. So when you're born again, you get a new spirit, you become a new man, but you have to put that new man on. Amen. You have to, in other words, you can be born again and, 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 and not wear the born again uh, spirit in your life. You can still be carnal. You can still be full of flesh. Amen. But notice that our spirit is born and, and created in righteousness and true holiness. He says, wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Again, remember now, he's writing to Christians. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking 
Be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God has, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Be ye therefore followers or imitators of God as dear children. I'll talk to you this morning just for a little bit about com- corrupt communication. Look what he said in the 29th verse. Let no corrupt, that is no rotten communication proceed out of your mouth of that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace into the hearer. When you say uh, corrupt, you're talking about something that's rotten. How many knows if you put a rotten apple in a bag with the good apples, the rest of them is going to rot? The good apples are not going to make the rotten apple good. Amen. And so anytime, anytime that you speak corrupt words, amen, uh, it's going to, uh, when you corrupt words or, or rotten words, it's going to rot, it's going to rot a lot of other things. Amen. Now, when I came into the faith movement, one of the first things they began to teach us is about what to say and what not to say. Now, Brother Hagin is the one that introduced this message to the body of Christ, but a lot of his followers took it in the wrong direction, okay? And he tried to correct them, correct them and, and most of them did not accept the correction. But the, one of the first things that, that, that the, uh, the faith movement taught us was what to say. In other words, you don't go around confessing that you're sick, that you're poor, that you're tormented, and you know, all of these things. Well, there's a balance to that, Amen. Um, and I won't get into that, but 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 I've heard people and I, I knew people, and uh, um, in here and in 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 even in uh, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and different places that I've been in the, in in ministry, I've heard people get a hold of that faith message, and so they would not say anything that sounded negative. Okay, they changed uh, when it came to faith or believing or, or, or a need of some kind. They learned to use their faith, and that's an awesome thing to take the word and confess the word, amen, to believe, uh, to bring themselves into a place of faith. Now, but I saw the same people that was trying to correct themselves in this area. I've seen them criticize backbite, fault find, gossip, lie, amen. So how many knows there's more to it than just not making a bad confession? Amen. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying. Uh, Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's a very familiar scripture. Uh, to all of us, but just think, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Did you know you can kill people with your tongue? It happens all the time where people give false testimony. People go to prison. Sometimes people are executed uh, because of, of what they what they say. You can destroy somebody's reputation. Mm-hmm. Death and it's where where's all that found in in your tongue. On the other hand, you can speak life. Death and life are in the power of the tongues, or the p- power of the tongue. Let me give you a few things about words. Words are spiritual containers. Every time we speak, there's something that's released, whether it's doubt and unbelief or whether it's faith and hope. Are you listening to me? But they contain something. Words contain something. Good somethings and bad somethings. Amen. Words are eternal. How many know you can't unsay words? Uh, how many knows we probably ought to start thinking about it before we say? Mm-hmm. How many knows that when you get frustrated or when you get angry or when you get hurt, there's just a strong, strong unction to say what you're experiencing? When you're in pain, you want you gotta you want to say it. Oh, 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 oh. You see what I'm saying? There's just an unction to say it. We'll look at some of these things in a little. Listen, what I don't get done today, I'll do next Sunday. Okay, or not next Sunday, but Sunday after. They are eternal, and I've heard this you know, from the uh, Reader's Digest, 
I'm assuming that it is absolutely true. I've said it many times, but I just want to let you know that words, after they're spoken, they never cease to exist. They never cease. It's like when they first begin to go into outer space, send satellites into space, they begin to pick up words. They begin to pick up words out in space. And they had to research it and find out and come to find out it was a radio program from the 1930s. It's still out there. Our words are still out there. They are eternal. Jesus said that we would all give an account for every idle word. Are words important? Yes. Is what we say important? Words are seed, the Bible says. Our words are seed. And a seed is designed to produce, and it produces after its own kind. So if we, pre if we speak death, we're going to get death. And not only do we get as much as we sowed, we're going to get it in multiplied form. But thank God the same is true about life. You can locate people or what I mean by that, you can tell what's in a person by what comes out their mouth. Jesus said, from the, abundance of the, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We'll get to it in a minute when we read some more, if we get there. If we don't, like I said, I'll get there next, uh, the next time I'm here, we minister. But words de de determine our direction in life. Words determine which way we go in life. You can't talk one way and go another. Right. Mm -hmm. I noticed that one of the first things that happens when you're born again, one of the first things that happens is you start talking different, mm -hmm. or we should. That's the first thing that changes. Everybody say changes. changes. Words can change what you believe. In other words, you can take the Word of God and st keep saying it con concerning to your mountain or your situation and say it until you believe it. Yes, mm -hmm. Once you believe it, you cross from hope into faith, and once you get into faith, then you receive the n what your need is. Right. Words change the way we feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard words that affect your emotions? Have you ever heard words that make you angry, that make you sad, mm -hmm. that, that, that stir up things on the inside, negative emotions on the inside? But on the other hand, he said, let all things be done with the use of edifying. When you speak life to people, you are edifying them, building them up, encouraging them, strengthening them. Amen. When you speak life to them. Amen. You know, uh, just to, uh, I like I like to say things good to people. I like to I like to tell them how good they look. And I've had people, uh, or, or or if you're ugly, uh, maybe I <laughs> maybe I say something about your hair. Maybe I say something about your clothes. Or I or I tell you how much I appreciate you. Yeah, you, you know, come on. We don't have any ugly people in here, okay? Amen. Amen. Um, so it will change. So we can, I, the people can say things to you, and it doesn't have to be true. I used this example last week about uh, Jacob. His son said that Joseph was dead. And for 24 years, the man grieved. He grieved his whole life, the rest of his life, because he was, he was in pain. He was hurting. He was grieving over something that wasn't even true. What caused that? Words. Words give information or knowledge comes through words. All right. So real quickly, I'm doing good. Real quickly, let me talk about some corrupt speech. Let no corrupt communication. Communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. And I have about 14 or 15 of these things, but I'm only do five this morning, okay? 
So be calm. Amen. <laughs> Corrupt con- communication, the first thing I've got is lies. Now, corrupt communication comes from that corrupt old man. When you speak corruption, it's not coming out of your spirit. Amen. It's coming out of your head, right? Now, the first thing is lies. The Bible has a lot to say about lies. Did you notice that in Ephesians 6, when he talks about the whole armor of God, he says, having your loins girt about with truth? Why? Because that's the place of the reproduction organ. So truth, when is released, it will grow. It will increase. But here's the the thing. A lie, a lie will keep reproducing itself. Long after the lie is told the first time, it will keep on and on. And not only will it keep reproducing, but it'll be added to as well. No lie when it begins out of a person's mouth stays the same. And I'm telling you, uh, the Bible says, listen to this, Proverbs six seventeen. God hates a lying tongue. I said, God hates a lying tongue. So you get to choose whether God loves your tongue or hates your tongue. I don't want a tongue that God hates. I don't know about you. James 1, 26, and we may spend some time, more time on these uh, the next time. Uh, James one twenty six says, matter of fact, I want to read that. In James, the first chapter, 26 verse. There's not 26 verses in there, is there? James 1... Huh? Yeah, where is that? Uh, 126. James one twenty six. Yes, oh, two pages are turning at the same time. My Bible is my Bible is uh, is huh? Yeah, my Bible's being rebased, but it's been through a lot. You know. This is what he said. If any man among you seem to be religious, now when he says religious, religion is a, to adhere to a certain code or certain belief and so forth it can be used in the negative it can be used in the positive okay christianity is a religion okay if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceives his own heart this man's religion is in vain see if you don't bridle your tongue and it's our decision. Are you listening to me? You can deceive your own heart by the words you say. See, you can say things long enough and you'll start believing it yourself. I know some people that call themselves prophets like that. Something will happen and then they'll get them meditating on their, oh, if I had uh, known that in advance. And they meditate on it and meditate on it. And then they begin to say that they knew it was going to come to pass before it happened. And the reason I know this is because I've been with people, hello, that uh, I knew what happened, but that's not the way they said it. Uh, They meditated on it and said it until they begin to believe it themselves. Did you know you can do that? You can deceive your own heart with lies. Okay? The second thing I want to mention is gossip. Gossip, listen to the definition of gossip. Gossip is a casual or unrestrained conversation or reports about people involving 
details not confirmed to be true. Let me say it again. Gossip is a casual or unconstrained conversation or reports about people involving detailed detailed not details not confirmed to be true. A lot of a lot of that's when you talk about something you don't know anything about. You're saying things that's not that you can't prove is true. You just heard it somewhere, or you thought it up for yourself, and and uh, you know you wanna you want to uh, impress somebody. Mm hmm. Well, what's the answer to that? What word have I used for the last five or six years? Investigate. When you start hearing a bunch of stuff about somebody, especially a brother or sister in Christ, especially about leadership, investigate. Find, if it, find out, see if it's true or not. Because many times it's either a total lie or it's just a part truth. I don't know if you know it or not, but uh, rat poison is about 99% nutritious and tastes good. If it didn't, the rat wouldn't eat it. Amen. You can tell a whole lot of truth and just add a little bit to it. And it's still a lie. So we're talking lies and then we're talking gossip. And the answer to that is Investigate. Number three is criticism. Criticism is the expression of disapproval of someone based on perceived faults and mistakes. Criticism is a condemnation. We criticize people. I've said this a lot later, lately. But we criticize people for their acts or their sins and we criticize them and we condemn them because they sin differently than we do. Because, because they've got a different fault than we have. Amen. But now when you criticize somebody, think about, think about what the purpose is about it. What is it that drives you, see, to speak negative things and criticism about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Some of us need deliverance from that. Because you're always looking at somebody else and never looking at yourself. You're criticizing, you can see it, everybody else's fault, but you can't even admit that you have them. You ever seen anybody like that? Yeah, yeah. And so criticism is corrupt communication. Again, think about the purpose of criticizing somebody. You criticize other people to make you feel good about yourself. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about when Brother Swaggart fell and and different things like that, and yet he was still anointed of God up until he was um, exposed. And I heard ministers say, "Well, I I don't even do that." In other words, I've got a small ministry; he has a huge ministry, and I don't even do that. So I'm really better than he is. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you don't know yourself very well, do you? You don't, know, you don't know what you would have done if you had the same stronghold in you that he had in him. I'm thinking differently these days. I'm seeing things differently these days. 
Amen. I'm approaching things differently. I'm approaching people differently. Religion is all about condemning people for not living up to a standard that set that you have set or that somebody else has set. Amen. Do you know a lot of times ministers will minister real hard against something because they're guilty of it or they're tempted by it? Used to, used to, you hear preachers, they would talk, they, and I, you, you don't know this, but I came up in this, and about 75% of what they preached was about uh, how women dress. How they, they are provocative. Uh, you know, they, they talk about even women wearing pants, suits, and women wearing makeup, and women you know, wearing short dresses, and you know, you know why they, you know why they fought against it so hard because they had a lust problem, and they think if I change them, I won't have a problem. If I change them, then I won't be tempted. Boy, I'm pretty. Y'all know I'm. So we want to change everybody else because of our, our problem. Hello out there. So then, so religion, now it's not that, well, I don't hear that anymore. I think most full gospel denominations now have moved on from that. Uh, although, let me say this. And you see this in young women uh, more than older. I appreciate the way our women dress. Amen. But you know, I, I like what uh, what somebody said. Uh, especially this is young, younger women, and not just younger women. But you know, if it's not for sale, don't advertise it. Who said what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. What would motivate a woman to dress provocative? Looking for a man? Well, no, no, no. A lot of them already got a man. But they want somebody to look at them. Yes, insecurity. Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, I know some people don't want, don't want a man looking at their wife. I wouldn't want a wife nobody to look at. My wife was a beautiful woman, but it cost me a lot of money to keep her that way. But it was worth it. There was a, there was a guy we used to work with, and he was like in his early 20s, and he came to church. This was many years ago, and that's when David Jr. was coming to church. And so they're standing in the back. He looks up there and sees Geraldine and said, my God, who is that? Junior said, that's my mama, boy. <laughs> She would go downtown. I think she was in the dry cleaners one day, and uh, you know, they, uh, she. And, well, they knew she was a Coker, and said, "Are you are you David Coker's daughter?" <laughs> that doesn't make me mad. That made me feel pretty good. <laughs> look what I got. Look all you want to. The fourth thing is, I'm doing good, man. Oh, my goodness. I'm going a little bit over. Okay. I just got two more. Can we deal with it? Uh, 
Another thing is the uh, words of deceit. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. I use this phrase from time to time. I'll try to explain it. Some people speak in what I call veiled sentences or veiled statements. They talk in such a way that leaves you, they don't say it. They don't say what they're really trying to um, get, you to, get you to see. They don't see, they, they want to speak about it in such a way that you leave guessing. I've had people tell me, uh, this, I'm thinking about this one incident, uh, and they actually told me that uh, you got some, you've got some adultery going on in the church. And I said, who? Well, I'd rather not say, I don't want to say, I don't want to say. I said, you're going to say. You come to me and tell me I got adultery in the church, you're going to tell me who, who it is. And if you can't tell me who it is, then don't come tell me that foolishness. So what they want to do is they want to plant that seed in your mind. Amen. And not tell you the truth of the whole matter. In that situation, this person perceived this to be true, but it was a total lie. And when I heard it, I knew it was a total lie. But in their mind, they perceived something that was not true. See? Do you understand what I'm talking about when I talk about veiled sentences? They say things without saying it. Mm -hmm. And they leave you in a situation to where you interpret it. They plant a seed so that you have to judge it and, and interpret it. And when they do that, you usually get it wrong. How many times in my years of pastoring, apostolizing, well, being bishop over the 35 years, how many times has somebody in the congregation came to me and said, so-and-so and so-and-so and so on? It took me a while, and just get my, get my nerves all toy, get my emotions going. Because I'm assuming they, they're not liars. But you know what I did? Exactly. So I go get the one that they're making the accusation against. And, I, and so if you're going to tell me this about this person, I mean, one time I remember, it, one time it was Eric. Somebody tell me something about Eric. Oh, Eric, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, uh, go get Eric. Eric, you remember that? When, it, when Eric came in and the person sitting here that was tell, saying all this and stirring my emotions up, when Eric came in and I heard his side of the story, And he said it in front of this person. This person had to admit that they were taking things out of context, that they were misinterpreting things. You know why they do that? Because that's what's in them. You know why people criticize? Because criticism is in them. You know why they lie? Because lying is in them. Mm -hmm. You know how why you people deceive and try to, see, that makes you feel important. I know something you don't know. And I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm talking about corrupt communication. Now, you know there's a lot more, but I only got one more. Can you stand one more? The next one is a tattletale. The Bible calls it uh, tail-bearing. 
people are insecure because they got to, oh, I know something you don't know, and I got to go. I got to tell you, you know, uh, my granddaughter, Lindsay, <laughs> I got. I'm gonna tell you something. I'm, I'm gonna tell you a secret, honey. But don't you say anything to anybody. Oh no! First thing she does, go tell somebody. I got a secret. <laughs> this. Would you like to hear some things that the word says about being a tail bearer, yeah. or a tail to tail? Proverbs eleven thirteen. A tail bearer reveals secrets. But he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Have you ever told anybody something in confidence and they run out and tell other people? I mean, if I wanted it told to everybody, I'd have just told it to everybody to start with. Well, that's one of the worst things you can do. Betrayal confidence. In my position, people tell me stuff all the time that they don't want to, that they won't tell anybody else, and they don't want anybody else to know it. And so I never it never comes out of my mouth. I never say it. Proverbs eighteen eight, the words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Talebearers they wound people. Proverbs twenty nineteen: He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Another thing that people do uh, is they they use flattery. Flattery is a, a corrupt communication. See, there's a difference between uh, flattering somebody and complimenting somebody. Complimenting somebody will edify them and build them up. But flattery is flattering them because you have an agenda. If I flatter them, then there's something in it for me. Where there is no wood, there the fire goeth out. I mean, you know, if you would, uh, if somebody comes and tells you something, and if you keep your mouth shut, it'll die with you. Where no wood is, there's no fire. The fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. Uh huh. That's Proverbs. 26, 20, Proverbs 26, 22. The words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. That is, that is very uh, similar to the one we just, we just read up on, where's it at? Anyway, you get, this, you get the picture, right? Everybody say, I got it. I got it. The words of a talebearer this is corrupt communication. Or his wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. I did better this morning. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So then the moral of this story is, as I've already said it. <laughs> is we need to judge what we're going to say before we say it. You have, listen, and some people are just like bulls in a china shop. They don't think about what they're going to say. They don't think about how, what, what I'm going to say now, how is it going to affect you? There's certain things that I don't say up here I stay away from it because I know there are people that have a problem with it or have experienced something and I don't want to hurt them. So I don't say, now I'm not talking about the word. We say the word, right? 
Amen. But some things I don't say because of the way it's not going to build them up. It's going to put them down. They're already under condemnation. They're already guilty. They don't need anybody to come along and make them feel worse than they already do. Amen. How strongly can I say it? Think before you speak. Now, 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 please. Don't think that I am perfect in this. Like I said the other day, usually every time I minister, I go back and, I, I, and I'll find something I wish I hadn't said. I used to minister out of pain. It wasn't right. It wasn't good. But there was a lot of truth in what I ministered. I've always ministered the Word. Can I say this? I just haven't always ministered it the right way. It didn't take away from the fact that it was true. It's the purpose behind the Word. We can't fix people. All we can do is encourage them not in their sin, yes, but tell them who they are in Christ. Yes, tell, tell them about what belongs to them, yes, that they can be free. Mm -hmm. Don't, 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 I just, I just can't stand church bullies. I can't stand people that just keep beating up on people. Boy, you want to stir something up in me, and I, I'd have to, I'd be done had to repent. <laughs> you know? Those that you condemn, Paul said, you do the same thing. The people you condemn, you're guilty too. You know, everybody in here has got a fault except me. Hallelujah. <laughs> real church, real people. Amen. Real people don't walk in pride. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and you know what? In every situation, when I get a lot of persecution or somebody's really attacking me or coming against me or trying to destroy me and my reputation, you know what I do? I go to look at me. What could have I, what, what did I do that gave them ammunition? How much truth is in what they're saying about me? And I've never seen a situation that I didn't find something in me that I could have handled differently. But most people, all we can do, and I know because it hurts so bad to start with, we're always looking at somebody else. And see, this is something, man, you don't know how bad I've been persecuted for this. But I've said it, and, and I'll keep saying it. If the pain's in you, the problem is you and you. If somebody hurts you, the pain's not in them. Pain's in you. If you hit your thumb with a hammer that we have done many, many times, it ain't the hammer's fault. And the pain is not in the hammer. The pain is in you. What about the pain that I talked about earlier when the Lord showed me stuff and that pain was in me all the time? Think about that. If the pain is in you, I mean, if somebody talks about you and lies about you and tries to destroy you, you're the one feeling the pain. So there's something that you've got to overcome because we've always, we're always going to be talked about, criticized, lied about. Amen. 
And if you don't deal with the pain that's in you, then that's going to govern your life. So if the, if the pain's in you, the problem's in you. So here again, we can't change everything. You can't change all of this. Apostle Paul was, he was, he was, he said, I fought a good fight, kept the faith. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. You see what I'm saying? So, I mean, for a man, what a, uh, and yet I, we can show you in the scripture where he had some faults, where he missed it at times. Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this? Hallelujah. Thank you for your word today, Father. I thank you that every ear is a listening ear and every heart's a receptive heart. I thank you that your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing where until you send it. Thank you for transformation. Thank you for the word. There's power in the word to change us, Father, if we'll do it. Father God, uh, uh, we make the effort and the Holy Ghost comes along and helps us. You have to give the Holy Ghost something to work with. As long as you think you're all right, you're going to stay unall right. Whenever you think you don't change, you're never going to change if you don't need to change or you won't admit you're, that you need to change. You'll never grow. You heard Stephanie's testimony today. Never settling for where we are. Like Joshua said when he was ready to go home, there's still much more land to be possessed. In prayer the other night, in corporate prayer, I saw doors of knowledge that we had never entered into. We don't know what we don't know. We can see what God is doing right now and we can have vision for what he's gonna do. But there's so much more. I saw doors around here that God wants us to walk into. Other areas that we don't know yet. How many believe we're gonna go in there? Amen, amen, amen. Well, to, uh, so you need to respond. When Sister Baker's here, you might be surprised what happens. You might be surprised how free you can walk out of here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you go ahead and stand?